Hello everyone and welcome to our second episode of iSpring webinar series about how to create great e-learning content from A to Z. My name is Paulina, I'm a community manager and I will be the moderator for today's webinar. And today we're going to be talking about subject matter, experts, stakeholders and roles and where do you fit into all of it. And as a speaker we have invited Michael Shiyashi. Hi Michael, how are you doing? Hey, I'm doing great, thanks for having me. Awesome. Michael is an artist, author, developer, and technologist at Alternative Media, and he will be more than happy to speak for you guys and to discover this topic. And I would like to mention that at the end of the webinar, we are going to have a Q&A session. So if you have any questions, comments, or concerns, please send them in the question box. You may find it on the right side of the GoToWebinar control panel at the very bottom, somewhere down there. And also, I just wanted to let you know that we are providing a special bonus to all our webinar attendees who are going. Yeah, let me just quickly open that slide with a bonus. So we provide 60 minute, 45 minute and 30 minute online face to face consultation with Michael after the webinar series is over. And in order to receive this bonus, you will need to answer this question. What did you learn during the webinars? And just simply post your answer under the general blog post about this webinar series. And I will be sharing the link in the comment section in a moment. And just get your friends, colleagues, peers to vote for your answer. And at, at the end, we are going to see which top, uh, we're going to see the top three comments that you left under this blog post. And we will let you know when uh, you will have that online consultation. I think this is a great opportunity. And at this point, I think that's all on my end. So, Michael, I'm going to pass the mic over to you. Fantastic. Thank you. All right. With a little bit of WebEx magic, I should be showing my screen. Um, Polina, do you see it? I can see it. And okay, I good. believe our attendees can see it as well. Fantastic. So I'm going to go ahead and continue on. So I appreciate it. And everyone, thank you for coming. And thank you, uh, Icepring and Polina, for having me. I appreciate it. This is very exciting. And I'm excited to talk to you guys about the various roles and the stakeholders and your part and your role uh, in the entire e-learning content development process. So uh, like I said before, and or I'm sorry, like Polina said before, uh, I want you to make sure that you throw a bunch of questions in and for discussion in the chat. Um, and I've skipped ahead to this slide just to kind of support that. Uh, so we really want the, the group interactivity here. Um, because we're talking about the human factor inside projects, the roles, we want to make sure that our human factor here in this discussion is prevalent as well. So this will be a laid back discussion. You'll see some slides. You'll hear some stuff from my point of view. But more importantly, get into the chat and let's talk amongst yourselves. So also, if you're on Twitter, if you want to live tweet, you can see my Twitter handle at mass underscore edev or iSpring Pro. Uh, be sure and throw some questions out because or discussions because we'll be sure to pick that up later after the discussion. So a little bit about me. It's all about me, right? So my background is in uh, film um, and Native American studies. I'm Native American. I'm the member of the Caddo tribe of Oklahoma. My last name, Shiashi, means little boy. Uh, I academically have a Master's of Fine Arts in 3D modeling uh, for video games and simulations. And I've been working in IT and e-learning for 20 years now. So currently technologist at uh, A&M Alternative Media. So as we go, uh, I want to each, each webinar series, I want to show you what we've talked about uh, and then build upon that to look at our current sessions. So looking back at, our, back at number one, uh, we talked about various methodologies to use in e-learning and the content development, whether it's Addy, Waterfall, SAM, Iterative, Agile, Scrum development. Any of these pipelines or processes allow you to create e-learning. And while we touched upon them and acknowledged them, more importantly, we just wanted to understand that you needed your own pipeline. So we developed sort of a general conversational content roadmap, one that talks about planning and pre-planning, listing out your current goals and your purpose of this e-learning content or the reason you're making it, uh, specifically focused on learner-centric, who your audience is, making sure you understand what um, 
web platform or devices or browsers that's going on, and also the learning platform. Is this meant for a standard LMS? Is it just living on the web? Is it for a learning record store and uh, tin can? and X, uh, X API and such. And also making sure that as you look at everything, you understand the user experience and interface. So, um, and we also took a look at getting down into the nuts and bolts of what each, each task and each phase, uh, and this is a study done by the Chapman Alliance, and you can look at the website online, uh, but this is a really great uh, slide deck that shows you how long it takes to create e-learning, uh, by hour, by percentage, and we had a lot of discussion on this last time, so I wanted to throw this slide up for you to see again, because it's an interesting uh, snapshot of what we do uh, as uh, e-learning professionals. So we also talked about things that should be considered outside of it, uh, whether it being assets you have to develop, uh, photos, videos, specific backgrounds, um, and today we'll be talking about what we mentioned last week, which is human factor, the roles, the personas, the personalities, um, last week, we also talked about making sure that you have adequate time to QA the content and to make any changes after that, um, looking at targeted devices and also keeping accessibility in mind uh, and also making sure we'll talk about assessment questions. Now, we have a webinar series later that will specifically talk about creating assessment questions and quizzes and all that, uh, but we want to make sure that we understand that in the planning process. So. So let's talk about uh, what we will talk about in this webinar series. Uh, there are 10 episodes, and so we're on week two. Uh, today we're talking about SME stakeholders and roles and how you, as a content developer or instructional designer or whatever your role is, how you fit. Uh, and then you can see the next weeks we'll be talking about either uh, writing on screen or narration scripts. And then after that, we're talking about tips and tricks for audio and video editing and capturing. Uh, and going into various weeks. As you see, as we go towards week 10, uh, well, the further we go, the more in-depth analysis and uh, real-world uh, demonstrations we'll have. So I wanted to have everyone see that. So let's talk about, this is the obligatory objective slide. Let's all cringe and accept it. So we'll talk about the various roles, the stakeholders, what you can do to manage expectation, what your true role is, how to be a learner advocate, how you can set yourself up for success, and maybe some tools you can use to collaborate with other people in your pipeline. Uh, and maybe we can think about looking at spicing things up with iSpring. So there's some various tools I'll show you here in a moment. So let's take a look at the roles. And before we do, uh, Paulina, if we could throw up the poll question, um, I want to ask everyone to contribute here. All right, can you see my screen? Yes, I can. All right. So. so Mm -hmm. Go ahead. <laughs> I just wanted to announce that this is the question. Right. So on screen, you may see, in case you can't, so it says, what is your official role or title? So use the chat window and tell us what your role or your title is. Now, remember, those can be two different things, but just generally give us an idea of, of what you have. So let's take a look. And do you already see the answers coming, Michael? So I'm going to, I don't see them all coming in yet, um, so l let me collapse, go ahead and make me presenter again and I'll continue on. Um, alert me to some of what you see uh, that, that sticks out if there's a lot of um, uh, instructional designers. Sure, and yes, yes, we do have, we do have lots of answers and there are training manager, instructional designer, writer, editor, faculty development coordinator, training program coordinator, managing editor, health and safety coordinator, training consultant, developer, training director, and we have several of each of these titles. Good, that's fantastic. So keep those coming in and we'll take a look at them. And um, also if you have okay. a, a difference between your role and your title, you can specify that as well. But I want everyone to sort of look at the chat. Look, we, we all have different roles. We all have different titles. And I want us to understand what each of us, uh, as, as we do, we'll have another few questions here in a moment, but let's go ahead and move on. So let's take a look at some of the roles. Uh, so I wanted to invest some time in talking about SMEs, our subject matter experts. So um, many of you have worked with SMEs, many of you have used SMEs in your pipeline. Uh, some of you probably put in the chat that you are a SME. So there's a really interesting um, article out on ATD uh, that talks about subject matter experts. Um, let me see if I can get a close-up. The important part here is I've highlighted it, and I know it's a little pixelated. Uh, it says the single most misunderstood and mismanaged asset. Now, 
keep in mind that, that word asset because we'll come back. In training and cur curriculum development is the SME. So the SME is, is very hard to define as we're looking at we're planning and the develop, development process. So I'll leave this up just for a moment in case if you need this link, here it is. So, um, but this is available on that ATD website. But why do I bring that up? Well, in the article, it goes further and it defines the SME role. Uh, and it basically says, look, there's no single definition of what a SME is. You can't just go, a SME is blank. Uh, they have their experts and they have expertise and sometimes they're geniuses and sometimes they're not. Sometimes they just have the knowledge that you need. Uh, and interestingly enough, uh, instructional design people or developers are sometimes the SME. Um, and so it's not usually someone outside of whatever your training or whatever the content is. It's usually someone that has specific knowledge within that. But they're very, very, very important to the success of both your content, uh, its efficacy towards your learners, and like any artist, developer, or anything else, uh, you're really, your content and you are missing out if you don't utilize them effectively. Um, so many have diverse backgrounds. So keep in mind, as I said, it's an asset, just like a artistic asset, a technical asset, something that has to be leveraged within your content and within your e-learning uh, development. So I want to just put a specific emphasis on SMEs and understand that it's a very broad term, but one that's very important and very vital to our e-learning. Uh, and interestingly enough, you may have other roles that you have to deal with within the pipeline stakeholder, and I put the obligatory definition here, uh, and let's look at the screenshot. So we'll say stakeholder is any independent party that has an interest or concern about what you're doing. So many of us work in specific enterprise level projects or have clients where we have multiple stakeholders. Uh, and you'll see sort of my joke here is everyone sort of pointing and, and demanding stuff from this little 3D character on screen who's pounding his head against the wall. And, you know, sometimes it feels like that because we have many different areas of people saying they have a specific concern. And many of them are, are actually uh, ones that are important to listen to. Some we're forced to listen to or obliged to listen to. Uh, and some we just need to understand that they have valuable input. So. I put this in jokingly, knowing sort of tongue in cheek that many of us have had to deal with stakeholders uh, in maybe a positive or not so positive light occasionally. But I wanted us to alert, I wanted to alert us all that stakeholders are something we'll have to deal with no matter what. Um, so, what you have to do is manage the expectations. So, Polina, let's uh, throw up the next poll question if you if you don't mind. Sure. All right. Okay, so the polls are open, uh, and so you notice I ask whether uh, you have, uh, let's see, where is it? Oh, it's in the poll section. <laughs> so are you an instructional designer, developer, or do you sometimes serve as project manager? So I'm going to go back to my screen. So let's go back, sorry. So you'll see sometimes that uh, depending on your role, you may have find yourself not only developing the content, designing the content, but many times as instructional design people, you'll find yourself managing the entire project. Uh, and some of you may have specific hierarchies uh, in your projects, uh, be it project management, uh, being uh, program management. So you may have different titles. So what I wanted us to do, and I'm trying to get back to my screen, sorry, uh, is understand the difference uh, between the two. I'm getting my face off the screen so it stops staring at me here. So. <laughs> uh, and so we have to understand that many times, whether or not we pro manage the project, our time may be literally divided uh, between managing the project and actually doing the development and the design of the course. So I wanted to to be aware that we've all had that pang and we understand. So what's the results from the poll, Polina? So it says that 88% provided the yes answer. Okay, so this, there's almost everyone has to, had to develop the project or manage a project at some point. Yep. So as we talk about pre-planning uh, and understanding your particular methodology or, or roadmap or plan is key in all of these. And whether or not that you have to manage the project, you still have to deal with various moving parts as well. Uh, so like the SME or getting feedback or managing their expectations. So 
I always suggest making uh, several backup plans or plan Bs. For instance, uh, time-wise, schedule-wise, if you're working with SMEs that you know their personality or you know stakeholders are going to have a lot of input, which can actually help your course or content, understand that's going to add time in the overall development process. So if you're managing projects, I always encourage you to add some padding into each and every phase uh, of the design, especially where humans are involved, because where humans are involved, there's a lot more technical or a lot more time consideration. So uh, I wanted us to take a look, and you saw a flash of it here a moment ago, but I wanted us to give uh, use a, a popular meme to kind of talk about what all we do uh, and what the roles are. So as an instructional designer, uh, you may think you do one thing, uh, which is really technical and juggles a lot. Um, and so sort of this is what my mom thinks I do, which is teaching old school in front of people. And in fact, many of you may do instructor-led training or may lead uh, in services where you do just that. Um, and what I think I do as a designer or developer uh, is explode potential inside the human mind, which hopefully that's what we do. Uh, what society thinks I, I, I do is just basically futz around and, and play solitaire on the computer. But what I really do, and this goes back to managing activities, expectations and dealing with roles is, is hurting cats, as the American phrase go, is, is actually having to deal with multiple items and managing various aspects and assets. So it can be quite a juggle. And I put this up because I think it's interesting. We all have the expectation and the internalization of what we do uh, and what we want to do, but many times we end up doing something very different, especially project to project. So hopefully this you'll understand this is sort of a jest, but no matter what your role is, I want us to, to understand your role is for your learner. And I want us to encourage all of us to become learner advocates, meaning no matter what your stakeholders say or what the content is, that you're doing the best for your learner. It's learner-centric information. And no matter how you've planned in each phase and given yourself padding, that you understand all this content and all this is for the learner. Now, many of you will understand we can't always win those battles. But keeping this at the forefront, keeping our learner in the forefront and creating content for specifically them helps us, um, you know, uh, give our case and helps understand and persuade others, including SMEs and stakeholders and others, why uh, we're developing for it and it creates a passion that can't be matched. So I always want to encourage, no matter what you your role is, and we'll go back to this one, what you think you do or what others think you do, uh, that we really focus on the learners. So I really want to punch that home. So what does it mean? When, what do I mean by a learner advocate? Well, we just want to make sure that we've developed uh, and s specific stories. Uh, and that kind of goes back to the agile methodology way of, of creating, uh, wherein you create you know, specific stories, but more specifically, creating um, understanding what your learner is, and know their demographics, know their age groups. Uh, I'm not going to get in the discussion of millennials versus non. Um, so there's some validity there and some not. However, the point is you understand what your learner is, how they learn, and, and what their uh, preferences are. And above all this, in, in being an advocate, you want to understand that being human, what I want to take this course, what I want to go through this e-learning content, is it just a page turner, as we call it? Um, and, and if you don't, then maybe you need to redesign or maybe you need to think about ways that you can create some interest or make it where you would want to. And I think that's key no matter how you're creating things is, is think about if you would want to take it or not. So as we talk about these roles, I want to hone down a little bit and talking about ways of, of making sure that when we deal with other roles and SMEs and stakeholders and uh, people that we work with within our group that we can create success for ourselves and our content. Um, so I'm going to make sure I turn my audio up uh, and I wanted to show this little clip. Let me turn my audio up first. And you may not hear it all, but you may not need to. Okay, so let me go ahead and play it. This is from Starship Troopers and this is one of the opening um, parts of the movie. So. Okay, so it's coming through my ears, so hold on just a moment. Uh, and in fact, I think I'll mute it, because you don't need to hear it. We can actually um, hear it. I mean, I could hear the sound. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. So let's go ahead and play. Young people from all over the globe are joining up to fight for the future. I'm doing my part. I'm doing my part. I'm doing my part. 
Okay, so I'm going to pause there. So, I, and I knew I'd pause in a place where this poor person on screen had a really bad facial expression. So, so why do I bring this up? Okay, so first off, it's it's to sort of break the the pace of what we're doing here today, and and rather than hear me talk, is to see something nice. But notice in this video, and maybe I can actually go back to specific places. Notice that we have a lot of succinct information. And by the way, anyone that has ever seen Starship Troopers know that this is. Uh, you know, sort of the director did that's sort of tongue in cheek. But in, in all this little opening sequence, uh, and this was, you know, 20 years ago, uh, you see this, would you like to know more? So I, that has always stuck with me as a way that we can have surface level understanding or um, survey of information, but we allow our learners or users to dig in deeper, to actually drill down. Uh, would you like to know more? And of course, once you, I mean, once they ask that question, then you know you can see the on-screen uh, movie actually had an icon saying, you know, top news for more. So why do I bring this up? Well, many times with our, specifically with our SMEs or our other uh, producers of all this content, our job as designers and developers is to distill that down to the core important message and, and story that we give to our users. And so we'll have a lot of information. So rather than having loads and loads of information, one way we can consider allowing knowledge to be transferred to our learners is allowing them to dig down further. Now, I know you all know this, but I wanted just to give us sort of a fun visual to have that in mind. And for me, this is it. Uh, and so we'll talk about other ways that uh, we can use this, uh, but more importantly, what I'm talking about is taking a really large, broad message and being succinct on screen, on the tablet, on the device, but being succinct in how we present that to our users. We'll talk about other ways to allow this drill down of information. Uh, some could be like just in timed learning, uh, can be video, infographics, and a little bit later we'll see how to do it with some interactions. So, uh, Going back to the role, so we all know that we have stakeholders. As I mentioned, we may have great stories, we may have other stories that are not so great. The, the gist of it is we won't always win. So no matter how our passion, uh, you know, and what our case is for our learners, we have rules, we have policies, and we have people that make the decisions. And in some cases, uh, if you have clients, you know they're the purse holders. They're the ones paying your bills, so they, they're the ones who make the decisions. So we have to research, say, on ATD or eLearning Guild or online or with our, our peers, what the best way to produce that quality e-learning content for our learners is. And once we do that, again, with that passion and with that information, hopefully at some point we can get buy-in from our stakeholders. Now, again, go back to item number one, we won't always win. But the point is that we continually try on behalf of our learners and being an advocate for that learner. learner. So We actually have some stakeholders joining us today, so. <laughs> Fantastic. Yeah. And so that's the point. As a stakeholder, you have important information, just like a SME does. And so that's how it goes. So sometimes as we create and develop, it becomes one that we need to understand. Everyone has good input. And so being able to take all that input and make good decisions on behalf of the learner is the most important part. So I think we have another poll question. Um, Paulina, if you don't mind, can you share that one? Sure, just a second. We have a question about how. Just a second. <laughs> I will launch okay. it. How many launch of you have one. used at least two or more of the iSpring interactions? Mm -hmm. So while you answer that, and so think about the specific interactions, I'll get to that. So guess why we're talking about that? We're actually talking about ways that you can provide that additional information uh, within being and still being succinct in your e-learning. 
Uh, and so here in a moment, we'll talk about some ways to do that. One easy way to do that with PowerPoint alone is to create animations. Uh, and by animations, I specifically mean uh, the ones you can animate uh, with the timeline inside of it. It's really interesting that you can create very robust ideas visually uh, into short animation or vignettes, uh, rather than having words and images on screen uh, for someone to do the page turner. So again, this would be using PowerPoint's transitions and animations, and also these are all available and all fully translate within the iSpring published. Um, also capturing additional information from SMEs, say, and allowing them to create their own videos or doing their own audio, uh, really helps uh, sort of boost and increase the interest level. And so allowing them to do that, share some of that knowledge, it cuts down on the on-screen text uh, and allows things to be more robust. So you can do that both uh, with iSpring audio and video capture and allows that person to, uh, for the learner, it almost gives a face or a voice to that knowledge as well. So before I move on, uh, Polina, how did we do in the polls? So we have uh, almost equal results. Oh, okay. Fantastic. Okay. So for those of you that have used the interactions here in a moment, you'll see some of this is um, what you're used to, but I'll go ahead and show it for the rest of us. So when I specifically talk about making interactions, uh, it will be up on the uh, screen in iSpring and the interaction part, and then you'll have a pop-up. So let's say that you have a SME or uh, one of your um, people give way, way, and that's good to have way too much information. Um, one thing you can do rather than having the on-screen text or the slide is create a small vignette of interactions uh, that someone can look at. So let me switch over and we'll take a look at each of these um, the demonstrations here in iSpring. So let me, there we go. So we'll just go down the list here. And this is from the iSpring website, so you can see the link up here, but basically you can go to iSpringSolutions.com and see each of these. This is the flipbook. Uh, and I'll be going through just briefly to show you each one of these and how easy they are to create. But one that I want to show you is here uh, on the iSpring website is how good these look on screen. Uh, and so you can take a lot of information that literally needs to be in a pamphlet or in a print-like area. Uh, and create that same look and feel rather than just an on-screen uh, visual for your learners. I'll just kind of click through the pages here. Uh, notice we have call-outs, we have images, we have uh, the footnote or the side notes. And so you can create sort of a very visually interesting uh, piece here. Uh, and this is with the flipbook. Let's go back for a moment. Okay, so that was the flipbook. And in a moment, we'll take a look at how to do that. Okay, go back to this. Uh, another demonstration I wanted to show is uh, the, the timeline. So here's the timeline. You can see it, it's literally a timeline. And again, uh, iSpring does all this, and I'll show you in a moment. Uh, of course, you have to have the information available, but you can click through any of these places in the timeline and get a lot of information. Uh, it can be as robust and as succinct as you want. Uh, you can have visuals that pop out uh, full screen for the learner. We can have different timeline areas. Now, again, it doesn't have to be a specific timeline, meaning it doesn't have to be date only. These could be groups of information that you want to color coded uh, as long as you, you know, put some information in. Uh, and we'll talk about how to view each of these here in a moment. But I just wanted to show you how cool this was to do inside. Um, also going into the directory is another interesting one that you can use. And, and again, I'm not suggesting that either the, any of these take the place of any of the content or learning, but that we use these in places where we have a lot of information that needs to be visually interesting as well as being organized. And these are some really good tools to do so. Uh, and we, the have, director, we have a quick comment from uh, Patty. I use the timeline for processes. Oh, for process? Yes. And that's and so let's go back to the timeline. So that would be a great way because in each of these you see that there's a little uh, almost like phase or, or group color. And so you, you can have a very long and detailed process that you can go through and see each of it. So that's a great use of it. I hadn't thought of that. So very good. Uh, and so the directory you see is, is kind of what it says, but you could use it for different things. I know that was loud. Uh, and so there's different ways you can do it. So this is very interesting as well uh, and allows a lot of information. Uh, and just like a directory, there's uh, information on the left that allows you to quickly uh, click through each entry as well as see entries uh, uh, collected by alphabet at top. 
So, and then there's also the FAQ. The FAQ, as many of us know, the frequently asked questions is a very important knowledge base to have, um, specifically if you have a broad topic. Those of you that have worked or do work in the medical industry know that there are a lot of survey information that you provide, but also very succinct terms and terminology that you need to make sure that each individual uh, understands and can use. So. Uh, here's a really great way to add those and in a succinct manner that is very dictionary-like or uh, very question and answer-like. And so I wanted to show us this so you see exactly how this looks. So they're very nice looking. Uh, so each of these, let's take a quick look at how to create these. Um, and so we won't take too much time because many of you are familiar with these. Uh, but I'll go into a different slide deck and so you can kind of take a quick look. And again, I won't have all the information um, or I won't have all the textual information to put on here. So here's a PowerPoint slide that's blank. Uh, we will go into the ice spring part. We will go to interactions. The screen will pop up, take just a moment. And then we can choose from uh, different ones. We'll just go down the list here. We'll take a look at the flipbook. We'll open it up and here is where you would add information being created, so just a moment. And I just want to quickly add that with the version 9 that's going to come out this year, we're going to have 15 interactions included in iSpring, which is very exciting. Oh, that is good news. So that's very good. So I would be, uh, I think we'll all be very uh, anxious to see that. So uh, this is that same layout that you saw, a cover, pages. And for those of you that have done work in InDesign or have helped uh, create manuals, this will look very familiar. Uh, you can go into the properties and look at the um, how it looks. You can have color schemes. You can add thumbnails, which come on the bottom. You can preview. Uh, I'll just add uh, a picture. Uh, I won't go in. I don't know if I have a picture that I can show. Here's an icon. Uh, we can add text uh, using iSpring's uh, characters. We can add those as well. So there's a lot of robust information that you can add, and I won't go through all of it, but I, I did want to show you how easy it is to add and create one of these. Um, and so you can also preview it when you get done, and you'll see the thumbnails that I mentioned here. Uh, and so you can take a look at it. So this is uh, one interaction that you can create. Let's go ahead and close that, and we will take a look at the next one. Again, going back to my PowerPoint deck, again, same blank screen. We'll go into interactions. And, I'd, and I'm not going to, this, uh, this is not a uh, how-to to do each of these. You can go in and sort of experiment yourself. And I provide links on each of these. Uh, so in the slide, the main slide deck, we'll take, we just took a look at the flip book. So you can go to the iSpring website and see exactly how to create these. And I think I have that link on the previous slide. Can't get over there. Let's go back to the, oh, I know why, it's because I'm in two different ones, okay, sorry. So here's the directory, and this is from pulling up interactions. Um, we can add an introductory section where we would say, you know, the intro goes here. A lot of textual information, uh, and we can add an item, so item one, as well as the description here, okay? Another item, and again, this is the directory. These would be the items that you wanted to be seen, and you can make main names or alphabetize them. Uh, again, you can adjust the properties of how it looks and feels here. Uh, it's, it's all turnkey. It's all just input uh, of information and data. Uh, very easy to use, and again, you can kind of preview what you've got, which you, you know, we, we've shown before on the main demo. So uh, we'll close that out, and we will take a look at the next interaction. The FAQ, which I think is really great for any of you that have created FAQ on your website or in your personal documents, you will find this very easy to use. Uh, you start out with the title and the question title, uh, and then you go in each one. So we'll add question one. There's question one's title. Here's the answer or the additional knowledge. Uh, we'll add another question. Whoops, misclicked. Add another question, question two, and then that would have the text here. And again, just like before, we go into the properties and adjust the look and feel uh, and the color scheme, and then we can preview it as well. So let's preview it, and this will look very similar to what you saw before with the answers uh, being accordion down to the correct section. So the last one I'll, I'll, I'll finish up with, and again, uh, you can get more information and how-to videos uh, on the iSpring website, is the timeline. 
And again, as someone in the chat pointed out, that it can be used not only for uh, temporal timelines or dates, but can actually be shown um, to have specific processes or processes to show something overall. So uh, information would go here. You notice you can add video and audio or links here. Uh, we can add, uh, this would be the period or the specific um, time. We'll add an event inside here and do another period just to give you an idea. Event one, part of uh, period one. And I have some weird font here, but we can take care of that later. Again, all this can be changed. We'll add another period, period two. Uh, and we will give a description here of what that means. We'll add an event inside that just so we have something to talk about. Event two inside of period two. And again, you can adjust all the properties as we've talked about before. Uh, we'll just preview it very quickly. Notice we have a color-coded timeline of periods down here or sections down here, and each of these have um, the, the events that we created. So that is a very, very quick and high-level overview of it, uh, but I did want to show you because it has a lot of uh, interesting ways it could be used. Um, and here's the link that I promised how to create a course with interaction uh, on the website. You can also go to the iSpring website and just look at the interaction section. So here's each of them. We went through the flipbook, the timeline, the directory, and I misspoke, but this is the FAQ, not the timeline. So. So really, no matter which one of these we use, we want to use them like seasoning or seasons in cooking. So I, I say that because let's say you love pepper um, and fresh peppercorn is great and ground on food, especially like, uh, you know, grilling meat. But too much is too much and it ruins the flavor. So in any of these interactions, make sure you use them responsibly. So again, making sure that you your content supports that learner centric uh, interaction and that it supports taking a lot of information and being succinct and allowing the learner to drill down into it like we saw with the would you like to know more those are very important so no matter what you use whether it's just on-screen information or any of these interactions make sure that you do so as a learner advocate and that you are not using too many cool things in order to um, just you know just use them so before we sum up, Pauline, I think we have one final question um, about... Yes, uh, we do. <laughs> you don't mind posting that. Sure. And I hope you guys can see it. So before today, did you ever consider yourself as subject matter expert in your own projects? So could you please let us know by taking the vote in that poll? Right, and so answer the poll question over in the, the uh, poll area, but also use the chat and, and expand on your answers once you do so. So the important thing here is I wanted to ask you, have you ever considered yourself a SME? Because remember, you must make sure that you understand that the SME information and their role as an asset, something you must manage correctly and take time to allow uh, to get the right information and to get all the succinct information. But thinking of yourself as a SME allows you to do that same thing. And what I wanted to, to remind us all is that we are SMEs and that we should consider our own input and our own learner advocacy as part of that asset, something very important and very vital to the e-learning content creation. Uh, so I wanted to remind us of that. So, so uh, you can you can see the results on the screen right now. You can, right? <laughs> Michael? Yep, so you can see, you can hear me now, right? Yep, yes, and we also have a comment from Jim. I have worn the hats of subject matter expert, instructional developer, and instructor, and the same project. Good. Yeah, we all wear a lot of hats, um, so most of us do anyway, and especially those that have various clients and such. So uh, from the polls also, it looks like that most of us have considered ourselves me, and that's great. So it's important that we consider our own knowledge and own expertise um, on equal basis and equally as important as the ones we're pulling from as well. So that's very good. So, you know, wearing the many hats um, is, is a typical um, response, and so I would say that that goes back to even if you're not a project manager, you may be doing the work of making sure your, your content is, is successful, and that may feel like, and it really may be, that you're wearing many hats. So 
again, making sure you understand each of the roles, the personalities involved with that role, uh, and that you value your own information and, and guidance as well, uh, understanding that you're doing it for the learner. So let's take a quick look at what we, we're summing here. Uh, we talked about the roles, the SMEs, how they're experts. Uh, we try to define them as best we could. Uh, we wanted to make sure that we respect our SMEs and stakeholders and understand that we are SMEs as well and understand and respect our own information. We talked about the various stakeholders and what we can do both for uh, SMEs uh, and stakeholders to get that information within our course. Uh, again, looking at our true role, uh, about what I think I do, what my mom thinks I do, and what I really do, but what we're really doing is making sure that we're advocates, uh, we're champions for our learners, uh, and that we empower the SMEs, we allow them, uh, or whomever we're getting information from, uh, in various ways. We can do it with interactions, with videos, um, with a lot of different tools, but we make sure that we collaborate in ways that are successful for our learner. So with all that, after I've done the official sum slide, uh, I wanted to open up, are there any specific discussions or questions you want to throw out? Again, this is a very fun topic uh, and one that can be fraught with frustration as well as really successful stories. So is there anything that we want to talk about as a group? All right, so we do have a question right away from Mary. Can you suggest tips for managing the expectations of a boss who has no experience with instructional design? E-learning is new at our company. Uh, I wish I had a, a, a pat ready answer for that. So I, I, I think that unfortunately in many cases uh, you have to play to someone's strengths. So if you have a boss that doesn't understand anything about e-learning or you feel doesn't have the same level of intrinsic expertise, what are their strengths? So why would I bring that up? Maybe this person is great at managing people. Maybe they're great at um, you know getting information and open door policy from a boss level, from a, a professional level. So do what you can to leverage that and be on their playing field for a little bit and see if any of that helps your e-learning. Now, again, that's a really weird uh, way to answer the question, but what that does, it allows you to see some of their world. And hopefully, if you see some of their world, they can see your passion and your points. So um, there's there's ways of understanding there are all, always differences between you as the expert in one field and say your boss or stakeholder or someone else in another field. Uh, and while I could say, while I would wish I could say that the answers are uh, easy and all you have to do is do this and they'll always be, uh, you know, champions for your side as well and for your learner, that's not the case. Um, but I would start by having those, you know, very clear conversation and transparent conversations where you say, look, I respect you as a boss and I respect you do things this way. Um, by the way, here are my expertise. How can we make these work together? Um, so maybe that would be a one way to get started. So. Okay, great. And what if you have difficulties getting the SME to stick to a deadline? I think we all so whether it's a SME or getting assets back from a, a graphic designer or waiting on your um, you know person that's going to be in the video as the talking head waiting on the studio time, there's always going to be the these really weird hiccups in schedule and so that's earlier why I said please plan ahead there's no way that we can always have a contingency plan for everything but we can understand that uh, we have pockets of time where we know we trust an individual or it's ourselves we know we can turn something around quickly we put a little bit of extra time there as well as that unknown time so anywhere where you can stick padding whether it's in resources having an additional person ready on the phone or whatever it is ready to help or whether it's someone else that can step in um, and understand the timeline may be compressed if this happens, if that happens. Have those frank and earnest and open discussions early with your stakeholder, with your clients, whomever it is, and understand, yes, we have a go-live date and here it is, but we have these things that go on. So how can you help me make these timelines work? Uh, that doesn't fix it. It doesn't make timelines not go. It doesn't make SMEs react any quicker. but Going into it and knowing that beforehand or knowing that it could happen is much better than getting at the end uh, and going, I have two hours till this goes on the LMS, what do I do now? So we all have run into it. We all have had those issues. Um, unfortunately, all we can do is continue to try to do our best and uh, explore ideas of how to make it work quicker. So. 
uh, if anyone has any information or or wants to discuss that in the group, I would be you know willing. I, I would love to hear what you have to say. So awesome. And um, question about interactions from. I'm sorry, Francesca. Do you see any pros or cons to layering interactions? Oh, that's interesting. So I assume maybe layering interactions one within another or layering them, say, within a chorus. So that I, I'd maybe be more succinct on that. But uh, there's a lot of pros uh, to using the interactions. Again, the interactions are visually stimulating. Um, they have some interest. Uh, they take a lot of information and put them in a concise manner. And Francesca right. says within a course. Right. Oh, good. Yes, within a course. So I, I would think that, of course, it depends on the course. Of course, it depends on the course. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> Rep. Uh, but also, right, <laughs> it also depends on the learner. So let's say you have a learner that really loves lists or really loves, you know, the, the visual aspect of the phases, uh, but doesn't love the page, you know, the, the uh, interactive flipbook. Okay, well, it's, it's a good idea that you don't put it in there. So, but knowing your learner's perspective, understanding what you would want to do and what you would want to see from a learner's perspective uh, is equally important. Um, but otherwise, I really think that uh, anything you can do to take information and allow the learner to uh, explore or drill down deeper, uh, I think certainly layering into a course would be um, great. But again, you don't want to overdo it. Like I said, use it sparingly, use it efficiently and be succinct. Um, you may not need all four or what is it upcoming 15 you may only need one you may need none and sometimes you only need a video of your SME with the associated links so whatever works best for your course and your learner that's always going to be the answer I give so right and we have a very nice comment from Peter e-learning production is like software production and there you have very often problems with the time schedule that's the highest risk in those projects I completely agree. And later we will we'll have a webinar specifically on creating audio and video. And you're right. That is one of the things that can always, you know, um, come back to bite you. Uh, and specifically, we talk about audio. Remember, I, I mentioned in the last webinar, re-records happen. And that happens for uh, video as well. There are projects where, let's say, you think it works great, but the person that is the stakeholder or, or purse, you know, paying the bills is looking the video and go oh I don't like that video we're gonna redo it that's beyond your choice that's beyond your control it happens mm -hmm. any of these iterations any of these phased uh, elements can really uh, affect the final timeline and all we can do is uh, make mitigating plans to help that and so I completely agree I've been on a lot of different video shoots I've done a lot of audio I've even narrated things myself uh, and so it takes time and, and again it takes time because we're dealing again with the human factor if it were our internal stuff, we can control that, but we can't control things outside of our human body. So. Right, thanks. And there is another quick question from Johanka. Lesson four out of this webinar series is scheduled for Thursday, September 7, rather than Wednesday. Just making sure it's not a mistake. It's not a mistake. It will be held, it will be held on Thursday, September 7th. So we will be more than happy to see you guys there. And the next question is from Brian. What advice do you have on introducing learning interactions to those who are used to page turners and are perhaps less tech savvy? Hmm, that's an interesting question. So um, one way you could do, um, there's an old, old joke. Uh, if any of you are familiar with um, Looney Tunes with Bugs Bunny and Daffy Duck, there's an old <laughs> visual joke of, of Bugs Bunny getting into a big boiling pot of water like it was a hot tub. And so he, he eases himself down. <laughs> and so with that, <laughs> with that mental image in your mind of Bugs Bunny, think about providing the page turners but also provide that same information uh, in these interactions as a resource. As a, like, for instance, you would have a link up top that says click here for a detailed view of these medical terms or this terminology. Allow them to view it and then get some real feedback from real learners. And many of you that do instructional design know that part of the QA process includes uh, doing UI and UX testing, going out with real groups and getting information on how they interact with it. So. Maybe this is one of your test groups. Maybe you provide the same learning as a page turner, provide a little bit more information and see what they have. But just as importantly, as you mentioned, the learner may not be tech savvy. Uh, so the keep it simple, 
person. So the, those of you who remember the KIS, you know, keep it simple, stupid. Uh, we're not calling ourselves stupid though. But so keep it simple. So continue to do the page turners, test out these other interactions and see what they feel, but get real feedback from your real learners uh, rather than being encapsulated in sort of an echo chamber. Uh, that's one way to do it. Um, you could also um, begin, uh, you know, rolling it out in outside of the course so you know you can have your page turners but uh, a link to a standalone you know FAQ or something um, that you could post somewhere else but anything you can get someone acclimated uh, and begin enfolding those into your process would probably help mm -hmm. great and the next question and I apologize if I pronounce your name Daidra is there a project management tool that you would recommend to manage an e-learning project with multiple contributors? Hmm. Well, you know, there's a lot of different tools out there from a project management perspective, and I hesitate to suggest any of them because many of them are geared to a specific methodology. Case in point, um, you know, using open source, um, sometimes free things like a Trello card, uh, like T-R-E-L-L-O dot com. Uh, it's kind of an easy way to get a Kanban-esque way, and I say Kanban, it's a, it's a way of managing a project by, you know, online list where you can drag and drop cards that, or tags that say, you know, in process or done. Uh, and I've used help desk software before to make sure that tickets are created for multiple contributors. Uh, there's a lot of good things out there. I hesitate to say any of them because when it comes right down to it, Managing those tiny threads of information and those contact person and the POCs for this and that just comes down to an organizational standpoint. And I can't say that I've used any of them better than others. Many, many people still use Microsoft Project. I have. Uh, it provides that, that timeline and, and have, helps you look. But there are other tools as well. Uh, there are even free tools for PowerPoint called, I think, you know, Microsoft Office Timeline or something. So, uh, our project manager. So there's there's a lot of tools. Um, a lot of them free. A lot of them open source. A lot of them paid for. Uh, I've used Jira, uh, backed by Confluence, and so that was an interesting way and very robust. So robust that the learning curve was uh, quite high for those that weren't technically savvy. Say for our SMEs or for our QA people that we just. Uh, went out and hired to be on a specific browser. Um, so a lot of these considerations depend. Um, I don't know that I could suggest any one or the other. It just depends on which one works best for your group and which one allows you to have organization. Awesome. Thank you very much for covering that question. And the next one is from Mary. What personality of an instructional designer create a successful SME interview, such as helping the SME feel at ease, build trust, get info from a SME who doesn't communicate well, etc.? And I think that, so you may remember, uh, I, I mentioned, uh, let me see if I can go back to our, our, our meme of, you know, what I do, what, what <laughs> society thinks I do. So that goes back to what we said about herding cats, you know, so really when you think about it, that's what you're asking. And so uh, I would jokingly say the best personality is to have my personality. I, I'm, I'm teasing. So, but you, you put up a lot of those same issues in your question. So how to make your SME feel comfortable, how to make them uh, understand that they can give as much information as they want. Um, I would suggest, and I perhaps always will, is to get buy-in with your SME and, and show them maybe a brief section or the whole plan of what your plan is for the learner. Get their buy-in and, and on your passion as a learner advocate. Uh, and let them understand how they work in the entire process, how they're going to, how their knowledge and how their information is going to contribute to making this the best course for the learner and share with them that information uh, and, and, and help them understand. So that may not work. Um, you may have SMEs that this, you know, it, it, sometimes there are hard nut to crack and that's fine. Uh, but doing your best and being succinct and, and have, helping other people understand why what you do is very important sometimes puts them at ease. So I, I would open that up to the group if any of you had that same discussion uh, or, you know, had that same issue with a SME. What was your solution? What allowed you to really get that information from that SME? And then let's talk about it. But thank you for putting that out. Thank you very much. And while we are waiting for more questions to go blah, blah, sorry <laughs> while we are waiting for more questions because we have a couple more minutes to go over them let me please quickly show you something 
All right. Can you see my screen? I can, yes. You should be seeing the blog post about announcing webinar series, how to create great e-learning content from A to Z. So what I wanted to mention here is if you guys would like to get a personal online consultation from Michael, which I think would be of a great value if you have any questions about your e-learning projects, without, uh, about communicating with your uh, with other people involved in that project and any other things connected to e-learning, you can do so. You can win that opportunity by posting your comments with a question, I'm sorry, with an answer to the question, what did you learn during this webinar series under this blog post in the comment section? And then get your friends, colleagues, uh, peers to vote for your answer and then the top three answers will get 60 minute 45 minute and 30 minute online consultation which i think is an excellent opportunity <laughs> all right so now very going cool. going back to michael no, that's all very right. cool thank you for sharing that yeah sure and then we have a comment from karen my best approach with smees is to get them talking about their passion you know, that's a great point. And so I think that goes back to, remember the question about the boss, like how do we get the boss involved or how do we get their buy-in if they don't have, you know, e-learning experience or what have you. That's a great idea. So, and that's what we're bringing to the table anyway. We, we want that SME information and knowledge to come forth anyway. So why not on a personal level, off camera or off recording, get them talking about what their passion is, see how we can fit inside that and, and, and both, you know, explore that. So that's a good you know, thank you for sharing that, by the way, Karen. Right. And I just wanted to also mention before we wrap up today's webinar that uh, we will see you next week, guys. And uh, next week we will be talking about what, Michael? <laughs> we will be talking about copywriting, uh, essentials for authoring on-screen content and narration scripts. And you may sign up for this webinar in this blog post that I sent you a link to in the chat box. And also as per this webinar, we will be working on putting together the blog post with a summary of what Michael has been talking about today. And also it will include the presentation and the video recording. And I am thinking about sharing it sometime on Friday or either Monday. So all of you guys will get the link to the webinar resources. So don't worry about that. Yeah, no, I really appreciate that, Polina, and the stuff you guys put out is great. So I would also encourage you all, you know, to go there and uh, let's give answers to each other. Let's have a discussion because really more importantly than hearing my voice and my seeing my beautiful face is talking with each other and getting that conversation with each other. And just like we pointed out with the SME just now, each of us talking about our own passions and our own experiences can only help to make us each better in what we do. So that's very, very cool. Thank you very much. Right. If you guys have uh, anything to share, you're more than welcome to do so under this blog post. All right. So at this point, we are ready to wrap up the webinar. Uh, I would like to thank you, Michael, for doing such a wonderful presentation. And I would like to thank all of you guys for being with us today. And hopefully we will see you next week at our next webinar. And I hope that I think... 100, I would hope for 100% of you guys to stay with us through the whole webinar series and then share your feedback how you liked it. I think that's a great point. I would love to see everyone back. And as you saw in the upcoming weeks, we have a lot of exciting stuff that we have to cover and a lot of uh, tips and tricks to get into. So hope to see you there. All right. Hope everyone has a wonderful day. And if you have any questions, don't hesitate to submit them to support at icespringsolutions.com. See you guys at the next webinar. Bye-bye.